Even today, there are few spaces more impressive than the rotunda of Rome's Pantheon. The whole structure of the massive walls and astonishing dome was made of the versatile and awesomely durable material that we call Roman concrete. Concrete was everywhere in Imperial Rome, from the walls of tenements to the soaring vaults of the great baths. But in late antiquity, after centuries of intensive use in cities across the empire, concrete disappeared. We'll explore how and why in this video, which is sponsored by Squarespace. Roman concrete began with a stroke of geological good luck. The city of Rome was located near deposits of the fine volcanic powder known as Pozzolana. By trial and error, Roman masons discovered that adding Pozzolana to lime and water made a remarkably strong mortar, which could be mixed with rubble to create durable foundations or walls. Unlike modern concrete, Roman concrete was not poured, but spread in courses. First, retaining walls of brick or stone were constructed as a sort of form. A layer of coarse aggregate, usually chunks of limestone or broken tile, was laid down between those walls, and concrete was troweled over the rubble bed, almost dry. The mixture was then pounded firm with wooden mallets. For centuries, Roman concrete was primarily a means of building walls and foundations quickly and cheaply. Ancient architects had no way of mathematically modeling forces or stresses or other things likely to cause the collapse of buildings and careers. They tended to be correspondingly conservative in their methods and materials. Eventually, however, it was discovered that concrete made with pozzolana could harden underwater. In fact, thanks to chemical reactions the Romans knew nothing about, seawater actually strengthened the material, forming nearly unbreakable mineral bonds. So, in the waning days of the Republic, the Romans began to build breakwaters and piers from concrete. Perhaps the most famous example is the artificial harbor of Caesarea Maritima, pictured here, which was built by Herod the Great with Pozzolana concrete imported from Italy. But it was only in the first century that Roman concrete really came into its own. Building upon earlier experiments, the architects Severus and Keller created a dazzling series of concrete domes and vaults for Nero's Golden House. After this, the creative floodgates opened. The next century and a half witnessed the golden age of Roman architecture, whose great achievements were made possible by concrete. The Colosseum, built in a marshy valley, was prevented from collapsing by gargantuan concrete foundations. The cathedral-like halls of the great Roman baths, filled with the sound of fountains and the glow of sunlight on glass mosaic, were walled and vaulted with concrete. And the rotunda of the Pantheon, as we have seen, is basically a gigantic concrete cylinder crowned by the famous dome. It would be hard to imagine a more spectacular demonstration of concrete's possibilities. Yet, within a few centuries of the Pantheon's completion, the Romans would virtually abandon concrete as a monumental building material. Before we explore that process, I'd like to talk briefly about our sponsor. As you may have guessed from the production of my videos, I am not especially tech-savvy. So for me, the process of building Toldenstone.com was little short of Sisyphean. I wish I had known then about Squarespace, which is designed to make website building easy for people of every skill level, and even mine. If you're thinking about building or redesigning a website, I encourage you to check out Squarespace.com for a free trial. Once you are ready to launch, you can save 10% on your purchase of a website or domain by using the link shown on screen. You'll also find that link in the description. And with that, back to the show. So what happened to Roman concrete? How could a material that was so widespread and so useful just vanish? It should be said, first, that the use of concrete was never that widespread outside of Italy. This partly reflected the fact that, although Roman concrete could be made with crushed terracotta or volcanic dust from other sources, Pozzolana made the best concrete, and Pozzolana was only found in Italy. The reach of concrete was also limited by the persistence of local building traditions in the provinces, which left little room for new construction methods. 
The basic reason for the decline of concrete in late antiquity, however, was straightforward. The buildings for which concrete was best suited were no longer being constructed. Sometimes this mirrored the lapse or reorientation of imperial patronage. In Rome, for example, the last truly spectacular concrete building was the Basilica of Maxentius, pictured here, which was finished by Constantine. Afterward, with the emperors based elsewhere, no benefactor in the city of Rome had the means or motivation to sponsor anything on a comparable scale. Monumental buildings were still being constructed in late antiquity, but the most prestigious were now churches, and especially in the Western Roman Empire. The default church design was the basilica. Basilicas, like Old St. Peter's, shown here in cross-section, were long and narrow, with window-studded masonry walls and wood-framed roofs. There was little need for concrete in such buildings. Even in the Eastern Roman Empire, where Justinian's Hagia Sophia made domed churches popular, concrete was seldom used. Concrete had never been popular in the culturally Greek cities of the Eastern Mediterranean, where walls, vaults, and domes were traditionally made of brick. In keeping with that practice, even the great dome of Hagia Sophia itself was not made of concrete, but of brick bedded in thick layers of mortar. Roman concrete was still being used by the later emperors, at least in certain contexts. We know that Justinian, for example, used it to build a new harbor at Constantinople in the mid-6th century. But after Justinian, the political turmoil that had already destroyed the Western Empire overtook the Eastern Empire as well, effectively ending large-scale construction projects for 200 years. Not all concrete buildings, of course, were monumental. Even after the emperors stopped commissioning large projects, concrete was still sometimes used, as it had been since the beginning, in the walls and foundations of residential buildings. But the buildings that were best suited for concrete, the big multi-unit insulae put up by professional construction gangs, were no longer in demand. With the general collapse of urban populations across the empire, in fact, many cities now had more houses than people. During the early Middle Ages, in short, when the few new buildings being constructed were almost invariably modest structures with rubble walls, there was little demand for concrete. Concrete was not actually forgotten, since, for the literate minority, descriptions and recipes were still available in the texts of Pliny the Elder and Vitruvius. The 7th century scholar Isidore of Seville, likewise, mentioned Roman concrete in his widely circulated etymological encyclopedia. By his time, however, concrete, like so many other aspects of the Roman world, was little more than a curiosity, intriguing, perhaps inspiring, but ultimately irrelevant. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Tolden Stone on Patreon. You might also be interested in my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Thanks for watching.